Welcome back to Super West on Sundays, everybody. And unfortunately, we are without our third and Steve, but it's going to be Dan and I. Dan is, of course, a senior writer and assistant editor here at Super West Sports. My name is Nick Bartlett, and apparently I'm a senior writer as well. And the two of us have made up other shows, but today we are two thirds of Super West on Sundays. So uh, how are you doing today, Dan? Pretty good. How are you? Uh, you know, I'm doing my thing. Still got my uh, Cougar shirt on, even though we're clearly the best team in the Mountain West. Um, oh, shoot. Um, <laughs> my, my bad, my bad. Um, all right. With that, though, let's go across the state. Um, sorry, guys. I am a Cougar alum for all of that. We're, we're, I'm in you. I'm not trying to take shots. We feel it. But um, in all seriousness, let's go across the state. And uh, you had kind of some initial thoughts in UW's a huge win over Utah yesterday. Well, I think they did what they needed to do. Um, you'd probably like to see a larger margin of victory. And then when you put it in the context of, you know, who's the best in the Pac-12 and who's going to make the playoff, obviously that'll probably be decided in the Pac-12 championship game. Uh, you know, right now we're projecting that to be between Oregon and UW, assuming everybody wins out. But uh, in the national perspective, I think you'd probably like to see a larger margin of victory. Uh, you compare sort of apples to apples when Oregon went down and crushed Utah and UW sort of struggled with them a little bit. I guess the second half was a lot better than the first half, and they really shut Utes down on defense. And so that's a good second half performance. Um, I, I just don't know. I feel like you wanted more. You wanted a, a bigger victory. You wanted a larger margin of win. Because um, we're talking about like a committee of people that are just going to pick four teams to play for a national championship. And let's say UW wins out but loses to Oregon in the Pac-12 championship game and maybe loses by, like, a field goal at the end. Games like this, where you only beat Utah by however many points it was, not enough, is going to play into their decision about whether or not two Pac-12 teams get in. And so, you know, every year there's always this perception around the Pac-12 that it's not even good enough to have its champion in, regardless of the record, unless – if they're undefeated, a one loss Pac-12 team has always been viewed as not good enough uh, to get into the playoff. And so this year, it's sort of changed where it's, it's the view is that the, the champion of the Pac-12 is going to get in no matter what. But right now, the, a Pac-12 team is not in the top four of the playoff. The committee continues to put Washington outside of the top four. They're putting two teams from the Big Ten in, and there's a huge push to have potentially two SEC teams. And if Alabama beats Georgia in the championship game of the SEC, Alabama clinched their appearance in the SEC championship game this weekend and are looking pretty good. So there is a possibility that Alabama beats Georgia and there's a huge push to put Alabama in with Georgia. So it's, I, I don't know where I'm going exactly with this other than you want Washington to win by a lot. You don't want to give the committee any reason to keep them out of the playoff in the event that they lose in the Pac-12 championship game. In games like this where Utah just you know, got crushed not that long ago by Oregon in Salt Lake City, you want Washington to have a better game, a better first half. The second half was great, sure. but And I know the defense is good with Utah, and so maybe it's to be expected that, that Washington's offense wouldn't you know, play as good as maybe they should have. But you're, you're at home, you're in Seattle, the weather favors you, you just, you want a better performance. And so I'm just slightly disappointed with, with the final score and, and how close the game was. I, I hear you on that. I think the one thing I do want to add, though, and it's important, is it could have looked a little bit better had uh, that UW player decided to not drop the ball on the two-yard line. What was it? Two Patala. Um, yeah. I mean, he wasn't even close in the end zone. So I think they would have went up 39-28 or 40-28 or something like that. But at the same point, I hear you because there's no guarantee that that defense then in turn goes down and stops Bryson Barnes. Obviously, they stood up for their teammates, got the safety after that, jumped up 35-28. So they kind of kept they kind of kept momentum going. But um, just to me, I can't – we're getting late enough in the season. UW, it's tough. I don't know how to evaluate them because they don't – look like a college football playoff team, but they do have the explosiveness of a college football playoff team. So it's kind of this weird middle ground. And the bottom line is they do have to keep winning. They have to keep winning big. But I think one thing, and before I touch on this um, kind of Utah um, UW game is where I think we're all overlooking Oregon State. 
I think for whatever reason, when they played the Cougs early this year, they got all in that weird little Pac-2 championship hype, whatever that weird game was. But Oregon State is a real team. It could still beat UW, um, could still beat Oregon. Um, maybe not Oregon. Uh, it can be tough, particularly with what happened last season. Uh, I expect the Ducks to get some revenge. Seems like I'm going on my own tangent now. But I think bottom line is um, UW isn't necessarily there yet. Um, they still got to beat the Beavers. And I think that's actually next week. But um, hopping back to um, this game, I was just I was just really impressed. Uh, it felt like a do- uh, I felt like uh, Michael Penix Jr. didn't necessarily have his be- best game. The wind was really kind of messing things up. I know Brock Heward was talking about the circling win in Seattle. Um, obviously, I never played on that field. Um, actually, I did. I caught one touchdown pass um, on a field trip, baby. Um, <laughs> I did, but uh, I did catch it too. I didn't drop it. Um, well, I'm so cool for saying that, guys. But um. But in all seriousness, I think that um, on a day when the offense was struggling, it felt like there were just a couple times where Penix Jr. just literally threw the ball deep to Dunze and he bailed them out. I think he had like three touchdowns or two touchdowns, three catches over 100 yards in the day. And he's just been doing that all year. And I think he is single-handedly – I mean, obviously not single-handedly, but I think he's almost the key piece of why the Huskies are a college football playoff team. I'm a big um, – when I come to evaluating football, whether it's uh, – NFL, college, Madden, high school. Um, I'm not a big receivers guy unless you have a receiver who can absolutely change the game in every way, shape, and form. Um, you got a couple down though, a couple of layers. Why can I not say this? You have a couple of those guys playing for the Arizona Wildcats this year. You got one up in U Dub, and you just see the way it impacts the game. So I think Adunze is just different. Um, he seems like a humble guy. Penix is obviously the leader, obviously going to get all the hype. There's something really, really special about a Dunze, and I think he's actually what makes UW special. Their defense really needs to be improved. You can't be giving up that kind of yardage to um, to Utah. Um, I, there's a huge play Sione Vaki got early in the game, and they were talking about, like, UW was surprised by his speed. The announcer's trying to be all nice. Like, well, <laughs> you're surprised by his speed. What happens when you face Oregon again or um, a team potentially in the college football playoff? Because you're surprised by – a, a converted safety into like a third string running back speed. Uh, what's going to happen when you face a five-star recruit who's been playing the same position for years and is the most explosive, explosive playmaker in the country in a top 10 NFL draft pick? Uh, seems a little bit different to me. But bottom line, um, Husky's offense still really, really elite. Um, obviously, they're still missing uh, McMillan. Um, and uh, Dylan Johnson is coming on really hot as a running back. He's really doing well getting real opportunities to carry the ball. He's shown a little bit of his dual threat nature also, um, catching passes out the backfield, um, previously playing in Mike Leach's system at, out of uh, Miss, at Mississippi State. And so it's just cool to see um, a really, really complete offensive unit, um, a vicious offense line. And I guess you can go ahead and say, um, in terms of college football playoff, college football playoff caliber offense, um, maybe a little bit more consistency is needed, but um, the defense still remains to kind of be seen. And uh, again, huge, huge matchup against the Beavers next uh, Saturday. Whenever it is, maybe Friday. I think it's Saturday because they got um, the Cougs and the Colorado playing Friday night. So um, next Saturday should be a really, really big showdown. Hard-hitting physical matchup. And, again, do not overlook the Beavs. Um, just ask the Ducks how that turned out last year when they got ran all over in the fourth quarter, uh, getting like 28 put on them in a row. So, yeah. And, wow, we spent a while talking about that game. Nice little starter there. Um Popping over the other big game of the day was Oregon versus USC. Um, was there anything, obviously I want your general thoughts, but was this kind of just what you thought um, USC being a little overmatched essentially? Well, I'm also disappointed in Oregon's uh, fourth quarter here. The, the game really looked like it was out of hand and Oregon was looking like they're going to score in the forties and maybe held you know USC under 20, which would have been, you know, great for Oregon's perception, uh, not only regionally, but nationally. And then you look at the box score and it's 36 to 27. And that's just not enough of a point differential to really change anybody's perception. So I view this weekend as a complete and total wash. I think Utah, or I'm sorry, UW um, could have won by more. And I think Oregon could have won by more. So if you had previously thought that Oregon was the better team than Washington, despite, um, you know, UW getting them at the end of that game in, in Seattle, you're not going to change your perspective. And similar, if you think, you know, Washington is better than Oregon, um, you're not, the, the results from this weekend aren't going to change what you think. 
So both teams had an opportunity to do something, you know, for their perception regionally and nationally. And I think both of them failed to move the needle. I think, you know, Oregon should have won this game by probably 20 something points. And they just kind of let their foot off the gas in the fourth quarter. Um, And I don't know, maybe they were playing different players or maybe they thought it was in the bag, but you know, it's just one of those games where you, you want to see, a bigger margin of victory. And it's the same theme with you, Dub. And they fell short. And so I don't know. It's it's a wash to me. Both of these teams are a wash to me. And it's just it's disappointing. And I really was expecting Oregon to win by more because they looked pretty dominant through most of the game. I mean, I think it was, you know, USC had four, 14 points going into the fourth quarter and, and then ended up scoring 27 total. So it's just um, it's something left to be desired. And it's the same thing with you, Dub. So. Uh, just, it's a wash for me. It's a complete and total wash. All right, for sure. And I'm going to say the same thing as you in a little bit different way. So here's my night last night. I'm going to break it down. The grocery store closes at 11. The close grocery store is a little bit better. Um, the one that's open until 1 a.m. is a little bit more in like um, actually a little bit closer to you, Dubs. A little bit more uh, drunk college students would be walking around. So I really want to get to the grocery store by 11. I'm thinking Oregon's got this. Oregon's up. It's about 1030. It's about a 10 minute drive. And yeah, you know what? They cannot stop that fourth down pass from Caleb Williams to Brennan Rice. I'm I, I got mad, man, because I like watching every play. Um, and then when I came back, it was exactly what you're talking about. I saw the score. Um, and again, I hate walking away from games this early. So when I saw the score, now I would go read every play, what happened. And um it, it just Oregon does need to do better. And to be quite frank, if Lincoln Riley makes a better what I feel would be a better coaching decision and decides to take the extra point. Um, this game gets real dicey at the end there, and I get really bad at myself for going to buy whatever the hell I bought from the store. So, I mean, um, this is, like you said, they just need to close it out better. Um, obviously, give credit to USC for fighting, but um, the Ducks are better. But, I mean, it, it's you can say the Ducks are better, but they also did miss a field goal that would have put the game away. Um, that fourth down pass was contested. Brandon Rice is a good player. Obviously, Caleb Williams is the defending Heisman. But, um, again, it just – whether or not the opponent's good, like you said, on the national landscape from the East Coast, when all of our Pac-12 teams always be losing to kind of these teams, it feels like on big, uh, kind of on the big scale, um, you need to do better and you need to put up more points. And particularly for Oregon team that is really good. Um, and the one thing I want to say while we're kind of comparing the two, um, I think USC will just say shout, shout out, I'll say shout out to Caleb Williams for keeping playing hard. That told me a lot about him. Um, but I think if when you're comparing UW to Oregon, I think UW is more traditionally a West Coast design team, really pass happy, really dangerous, um, explosive through the air, just um, tough all around. Again, as we touched on, two receivers. Now you have a receiver out of the backfield, I think uh, West over at tight end. So they're really just complete, um, tough offensive line. They can really do everything. Whereas Oregon's mil- more built like a traditionally um, SEC team. They have that vicious uh, front line with a uh, doorless um, Amave. Um, I know I'm saying that wrong. I've been trying. I heard a hundred times yesterday. Um, and so you're just looking at a team. Um, you got Evan Williams in safety. I know it's kind of the back end. So it's kind of just a different, two different teams stylistically. And uh, for me, I like the way Oregon's built a little better. But um, I always did have trouble in Madden stopping vicious passing attacks. So um, I respect that UW's probably going to be hard for just about anyone and everyone to stop. So. I just want to, it's interesting to see how these styles um, kind of will play out and uh, if they do meet and if they do clash again. But again, do not forget about the Beavers, man. Do not forget about the Beavers. Um, and so the next game um, I want to talk about here, um, actually, I'm going to let you talk about is uh, UNLV Wyoming. Um, you got any thoughts? I know um, Jade and I have had a pretty good game. Well, this game was on Friday night. It's the first chance I got to watch UNLV all game or all season. And I, caught, I think the part of the fourth quarter and part of the third quarter, I noticed that UNLV runs this very interesting offensive formation where they have two running backs lined up right next to the quarterback. So if you're just looking at the screen, you got a quarterback, you got a running back right next to him, and then a running back right next to him. And that is a very, very unique offensive system. And I almost texted Steven to ask him, is this what they do always? Because if it's true and they run like it's like um, uh, it was a shotgun based offense with an RPO, but it's um, I don't know how to describe it because it's so odd and it was so unique, but it was effective and it was working and they would run it most of the times. But when you do pass the ball out of it, you find an open receiver 
an open space. And they were just, you know, running the score up on Wyoming. Didn't really even seem, you know, close. And Wyoming is a decent team. It's not like that's one of the bad teams in the Mountain West. And so I just thought that 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 offensive system was so unique and interesting that I wanted to mention it on on this episode today. And it makes sense that they're so they got eight wins or something, or at least seven wins, and they've really turned around their their program there at UNLV. So I think it's got to be having to do with the offensive system that they run because that is like, that's so foreign to prepare for just to like, to know where the ball is going. It's unpredictable. And they have a quarterback that's willing to run and looks like some speedy running backs that are more, not necessarily power, but are sort of, you know, speed based. And so you do these, you know, like RPO to one, and then you could throw it to the other one out of the backfield or you can fake the RPO to the first one and then do your actual RPO with the second one. Or you could have them lined up like that and just throw the ball as a standard shotgun pass. And so it's a lot of variable. It reminds me of Rich Rodriguez's system with an extra running back put in there. And so that's going to be really effective moving forward for them. And you got to keep an eye on with all these coaching availabilities that have popped up this morning. I guess Texas A&M fired their coach. Boise State fired their coach, which we'll talk about next. But if you have an innovative offensive system like that with a team that's having success that hasn't before, like UNLV, you got to be really careful about that coach getting poached or your offensive coordinator getting poached. So we'll see if they're able to maintain it going into the next season. But I, I like that offense. That was great to see. Uh, yeah, I loved you. I loved your excitement there. I thought uh, thought you might, you know, I'm not going to make some corny ass analogy. <laughs> I thought about it, um, but no. Um, so I think, um, and one thing, yeah, for UNLV, I think this game was a huge win for them. I think they're still in the midst of everything. I'd have to pull up the Mountain West standings, but um, doing my previews last week, uh, I'm pretty sure now they're in the thick of legitimately competing for um, a mountain a spot in the Mountain West title game. So um, kudos to them. And I still, I'm hoping their fan base does come out and show. Again, I saw a, um, kind of a graphic put up by Super West Sports a long time ago. Um, it's Sorry, guys, this is actually the truth, though, where um, UNLV literally – like had like 35% of their fan show for games is like worst of all teams in the super West. And that's out of 25 teams. And that's how some really some fan, fan bases that don't care. So I would like to see a little bit more excitement out of uh, that fan base in that program. You can get away from the strip for a second guys. And uh, I know there's some things to do in that state, but uh, you know, you got a football team now. And so um, talk about Andy Avalos too. I think as a guy who lived in Pullman and lived in Seattle, I can give kind of two different takes on this. So Pullman is what you'd call the inland Northwest. Uh, it's Idaho. It's where the University of Idaho is. People always want to clump it as like the Pacific Northwest. That's the inland Northwest. And they've been the monsters of the inland Northwest. Forget WSU. Uh, obviously, Gonzaga doesn't have a football team. But um, they've been the team. They've been the team. Uh, bottom line, they've been dominant. They've been the old West. You know you're going to go lose on that blue turf. And uh, they were also a team that going back 10 years ago, 15 years ago with Chris Peterson, that would come into Oregon and knock off a team like Oregon that would come into Seattle and beat a team like Seattle. Now, Boise state isn't quite that anymore. And now they're a team that's losing to, I don't want to say bottom tier mountain West squads, but they're losing to some middle of the road mountain West teams. And this is not what you expect out of Boise state. Um, I don't claim to be a deep, deep insider. Steve could probably give you a little bit more on uh, the Broncos in terms of all, you know, the, deep coaching personnel and player acquisitions and things like that and how this is going to affect the turnover. But just from a culture standpoint, um, Boise State doesn't strike the same fear um, in opponents. Um, I'll put it this way. Even if my terrible four and 700 Cougs um, champions in the Mountain West play Boise State, I think uh, the Cougs should give them a little bit of run for their money. Um, and that's just indicative of how far the Broncos have fallen. Um, it's unfortunate for Andy Avalos. I wish, I wish um, every coach, um, you know, Every person, you know, best best of luck in their future, whatever life, next move, whatever you want to call it. He probably won't be working at Chuck E. Cheese. I think he'll land on his feet somewhere. So, you know, um, best of luck. But the culture, it hadn't really fallen off. And they're not even like the champions of the Inland Northwest now. Now they're kind of just another Mountain West team with a lot of um, storied history. So it should be interesting to see who their next hire is. And hopefully they can get the culture back. And um, I think we had one more Pac-12 game, kind of hopped over the Mountain West there. Did you want to talk about, was it um, UCLA, ASU? Yeah, so I was watching this game at the same time as uh, the Oregon game was on. And 
Arizona State was running some of the weirdest formations I've ever seen, some of the strangest personnel like decisions that I have also ever seen. Like, for example, I remember this play specifically. There was Cameron Scatbo, who is the running back, lined up as quarterback, and I'm pretty sure they either had a tight end or a wide receiver lined up next to him as running back. It was third and long. He did an RPO, you know, fakes the ball to the wide receiver tight end who goes across the field and then throws it 30 yards down the field to, I, I guess, a wide receiver who caught it for a touchdown on third and 10. And <laughs> so you got, you got, and they also were using a tight end as quarterback. And I'm pretty sure their tight end threw at least one pass. So I can pull up the stats real quick. But the, the point is that they're getting extremely innovative in their personnel their formations and their play calling. And they have to do that because of the injuries along the offensive line are so bad. And they were also running this, like, I forget what Kenny Dillingham was, was describing the formations name as, but essentially they have your center and maybe one or two other linemen, and then your quarterback in the middle of the field. And then you have probably four or five like linemen on the other sideline with a wide receiver behind him. And then like two or three other linemen on the other side of the sideline with a wide receiver behind him. And the quarterback would snap the ball and could either quarterback run it straight up the middle if you don't line up properly or throw it to one of those wide receivers as a screenplay. And they ran that formation and play like 10 times. It wasn't just like a one-off here, you know, think about this play or whatever, just to get the defense thinking. They did it consistently. It was part of their game plan to run that offense. And so, and it it kind of worked. The whole thing was the one of the weirdest games I've ever seen, and it it worked. It they scored 17 points, and they won the game. So, um, yeah, you know, I just it is what it is. I guess ASU has to do it because of their injuries. But it was um, like for a boring game, for a low scoring game, it was one of the most entertaining that I've seen in a while. Like, I don't know if you guys remember the cheese it bowl from like 2017 with Cal and whoever Cal played TCU. Maybe it was like seven to six final score or whatever, but there was like seven interceptions and it was one of the most fun games to watch. This was kind of having cheese it bowl vibes without the turnovers. So like, I think UCLA went for it on fourth down, like two or three times in the red zone, never got a single one of them. And went for it another fourth down. I don't think they got it either. I think they're 0 for 4 on fourth down or something. And so coaching decisions, interesting from Chip Kelly, you know, could have taken the three points while well, those times uh, would have had the lead. Uh, certainly, I think going into halftime or at least it would have been tied. And it's just, I don't know, is it time for Chip Kelly to leave? You know, the UCLA media has been pushing that narrative for a couple seasons. Uh, they, they are really upset with the, program state of affairs and where it's at and I think for me like if you're gonna go with Dante Moore earlier in the year you have to ride with him no matter what mistakes he makes you're putting in a true freshman quarterback that's a five-star recruit that you flip from Oregon he's gonna go in he's gonna make mistakes you gotta roll with him if you're gonna give him the keys you've gotta let him crash the car like he's gotta learn how to drive right and so but but they took him out they 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 stopped playing him after he threw those three pick sixes three games in a row. And now you, you know, you had Ethan Garbers who now got hurt at Colin Schley, who is a good runner, but probably not the best thrower. And so it's just been mishandled. The quarterback situation has been mishandled and you got Deanton and Lynn that's, you know, turned UCLA into an extremely formidable defense and it's completely wasting the defense that they have there. And so I don't know, maybe it is time, time to fire Chip Kelly. I know his buyout's pretty big, but they can probably find the money there in UCLA and yeah. Okay. I'm looking at the stats. So the tight end for ASU two for two for two yards. Okay. <laughs> Cameron Scatbo three attempts, but he made one, one completion for 25 yards and a touchdown. Scatbo also ran it 12 times for 61 yards and a score. The tight end ran it six times for 14 yards. So the tight end was, was lining up as like, a quarterback and threw it twice, completed both and ran it six times. So, okay. That's at least eight times that he's lined up as quarterback. And Oh yeah. Scatbo also punted it um, four times. Let me see. He, he was a punter too. 
Um, let's see, all the way down here. Oh, no, he only punted it once. I thought he punted it more than once, but he only punted it once for 50 yards. So you got a running back that's lined up as quarterback, throwing a touchdown, running the ball, and punting it. And so that's just – that's what happened in that game. It was on the Pac-12 Network, so nobody got to see it. But, man, I was – I had a great time watching that one. Uh I am absolutely baffled right now. And for those of you who didn't watch, I'm going to try and break this down. So from what I understood, there, we, had, we, had a, we had a tight end run the ball four times. Um, Kenny Dillingham invented a new formation, essentially. Yep. Um, and we had a running back punt the ball. And it was the, even shockingly, it was a 50-yard punt. Yep. Okay, um, <laughs> and then maybe most importantly, uh, which threw me out of commission for two minutes when you said "cheese it bull vibes." That is, that is a uh, man. You you might want to patent that right there. You know, like um, in all seriousness. So, all right, wow. Um, from the cheese it bull vibes man, um, to our players of the week. Um, so I'm going to start with. Um, Roma Dunze um, didn't actually have the biggest statistical game. And what we're what I'm kind of doing um, at this point of the year is I'm given it, it is a legit player of the week. Um, but I also do want to highlight some players who I think just deserve the love um, who have really been killing it all year. And again, as I touched on for Dunze, I'll start with the stats, uh, three receptions, 111 yards and two touchdowns. But it's more so his impact on the game. Um, yeah, UW is two good receivers really. Um, uh, they've been missing their third for a while now. But again, Penix just knows if he has one on one, and I'm not talking, it doesn't matter whether like who is covering him. It doesn't matter if, um, what's that, what's that dude's name? Travis Hunter. It doesn't matter if Travis Hunter is covering him. It does not matter. He's going to throw the ball to a Dunze, and a Dunze is going to win. And that weapon, it just changes things. Um, you can't, you can't blitz effectively now because you know you're going to get burnt at some point. And uh, you saw this during the Utah game. There are a couple of plays where literally um, Penix just threw the ball in the air. It, it was not a good throw. It was not a logical throw. Was, I'm just going to see what a Dunze does. And per usual, he catches it. And you see him end up again. Only three touches. But in those three touches, over 100 yards and two touchdowns. And that's how you impact a game. Um, and particularly impact a game against a sticky Utah defense. Uh, you know they're not accustomed to giving up big plays. So you know he actually to fight and earn it. Um, Again, uh, UW may not be quite Oregon top to bottom, but when you have a player like a Dunes, they can go out and just grab 60, 70, nothing, 30 here, 20 here, a quick little 10-yard slant because he's a smart player too, blocks. It changes everything. Um, the defense has to adjust for it, and there's really not a weapon quite like him in the Pac-12. Um, it, it, last year, I think of a guy like Jordan Addison, but I think Roma Dunes is actually, um, a, a, I don't want to say a huge step above him, but definitely a, a step or two uh, ahead of where he was at. Um, but I'm, I guess we're going to stay in order here this week. I'll go with, um, also for defensive, my defensive player of the week. And Dane, tell me if you want to throw in something on a Dunze or anything for offense or defense. Um, but my defensive player is going to be Evan Williams. Uh, same thing, safety for Oregon. Nine tackles, six solo, one sack. Um, in a week that there wasn't necessarily any huge standouts, he's been a consistent rock for Oregon. And I know with all the kind of the big names up front, Dorless is probably the most prominent name on the defense. Um, I think he gets overlooked. Again, he's a transfer from Fresno State. And as I've touched on before, um, the safety position is the most important um, position on the field um, in, on defense, in my opinion. It's like the quarterback. Since you've all heard this rant 722 times, Dane's probably heard it 200 times. I'll keep it short. Bottom line, he needs to see everything. He needs to limit big plays, and he needs to hopefully – keep the 20 yard, uh, the 80 yard plays to 20 yard plays, the 20 yard plays, 10 yard plays and um, so forth. Uh, he does all that, but along with that, he also impacts the game. He'll come hit a player in the backfield. He'll make a sack. He'll maybe knock down a pass and he's just always all over the field. And I think on a Oregon defense that has a lot of players who will probably be more impressive and more, not impressive, but more notable and uh, make more impact at the NFL I think Evan Williams, um, and again, maybe he keeps working, but I think Evan Williams is a key piece on this defense. And again, that safety position, he's really held it as a lockdown transfer. So again, this week, maybe not as big a statistical performance. Again, nine tackles, six solo, one sack. But he's been doing it all year, and he's just a player I'd love to watch and want to give him a little love as well. Uh, Dane, I know you got a special teams play of the week, actually. 
Yeah, uh, Arizona's Tyler Loop kicking the game-winning field goal as time expired out there in Boulder. Uh, to get to that point, Jetfish had to clock manage very strategically. Um, Arizona had the ball at the one-yard line. Colorado had a timeout, and there was like a minute and five seconds left. And Arizona ended up kneeing it three times, kicking the field goal um, with like two seconds left on the clock and, and won the game. So I thought that was a pretty good um, clock management and game-winning field goal. And then Loop also hit a 52-yarder earlier in the game that uh, was really in a key moment that um, helped Arizona get that win. Definitely. Any uh, any time a college kicker hits a game winner is not guaranteed, <laughs> never guaranteed. And then um, I guess I'll throw out the stats. Then if there's anything quick you wanted to throw out about uh, Jaden uh, May- uh, Mava, um, he had, uh, he's our freshman of the week UNLV. Obviously that win we touched on earlier, but 17 for 24, 232 yards, one touchdown through the air. And he had 11 carries, 40 yards, and um, – two touchdowns on the ground. I know you'd kind of touched on their system and them stylistically. Was there anything you had uh, wanted to add about him in particular? Are you good? Nah, I think just, I liked how they run their offense. And um, when you have a willing quarterback or a willing running quarterback, it makes it entirely different in an RPO. Um, that's more run base because it opens up the field dramatically. So shout out to that guy for willing to run it. However many times you said 11 and got two touchdowns. So uh, there, that's, that's what you got to do. Deal. And then because we never discuss this anymore, I don't know why we don't like playing the South, Steve included. Do you have a team or not team of the week? We all just throw ourselves under the bus on this one. Yeah, team of the week, Arizona State going on the road, beating UCLA and Pasadena with a ton of injuries along the offensive line, having innovative game plan, personnel groupings, doing everything that needed to do. Brian Ward holding UCLA's deep or offense to seven points. Uh, it's got to be Arizona State. All right, and my – I guess I'll do not team of the week. Uh, man, I can't BS this, bro. It's the Cougars. They're trash, bro. They lost to ASU. <laughs> I was trying to make an argument for San Diego State. No, they're having a rough year, and you could probably put them in this category. But, I mean, the Cougars in the last three weeks have now lost to Stanford, um, ASU, and I don't know, someone else. Who cares anymore? So, I mean, they're literally lost to any team they should have beat. Um We'll see who wins versus Dion, but they're my not team of the week right now for sure. If there's another team out there more deserving, lose by more next week or something. Um, but bottom line, we're getting to the end of the college football season. It's been it's been a pretty interesting year, the final year of the Pac-12, and I think it's starting to – I feel like it's starting to resonate home a little bit, um, particularly for kind of some of the teams. Um, for Like, for example, my cousin went to ASU, and uh, I was just watching the WSU-ASU matchup earlier this year. Um, and it would just resonate with me. Like th- this is probably the last time I'll ever see um, this match on a consistent basis or even like something weird like Arizona, Washington. Obviously I'm throwing in the references of our schools, but um, you could also do like, um, or I should say our areas, but um, you could also do, um, you know, like a, even like a UCLA Cal match. Are we going to see this anymore? So I think those little things are starting to resonate with me, um, particularly, particularly with the schools again, that just, yeah, it's just starting to resonate with me. Um, so on that, Dane, you got anything else you want to add before we get out of here? Uh, no, just I think that the Pac-12's ability to get a team in the playoff um, is – is it's probably going to happen. But I was saying earlier in the year that the possibility is for two. Uh, I still think that could happen, but it seems unlikely with Alabama surging and the push to get um, potentially two SEC teams in there. And then you got an ACC, probably going to be an undefeated champion with Florida State. There's always a push to put two Big Ten teams in there. So, you know, it's just it's getting nervous. I'm getting nervous, man. Like, I know probably a Pac-12 team is going to get in. The champion of the Pac-12 deserves to be in. But there's there are forces at work that are trying their hardest to make sure that doesn't happen. And there's going to be a push for two SEC teams. There's going to be a push for two Big Ten teams. So we need we need these these teams to win by by more in these big games and um, it hasn't happened this weekend so we'll see moving forward. All right, I, I yeah that sounds uh, pretty much what's important at this point of the year is definitely the college football playoff and uh, seeing how that plays out. So um, for Dane, I'm Nick, and uh, this episode of Super West on Sundays definitely had a cheesable vibes. Deuces. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>